wonderful honor to be here today at this Sankalp Forum, speaking in this session about how do we take total sanitation beyond just construction of toilets? How do we make it something that is used, usable, desirable for everyone? And also, how does our definition of sanitation expand beyond just what we're doing in a toilet. There's a beautiful story that I love that I want to begin with sharing, which is a story of three men who are stranded on a boat in the middle of the ocean. And as people tend to do when they get stressed, the three men start to fight. And what they decide to do to alleviate this tension and fighting is they divide the boat into three separate portions, much like young children do in a bed or in their bedroom. And so they draw these invisible lines down the boat so that each of the three men has his own one third of the boat. And one day, two of the men look over and they notice that a leak has sprung in the third part of the boat. And they say to the man who sits in the third part of the boat, stop up the leak. The boat is going to sink. Water's already flooding in. We're all going to drown. And the man sitting in the third part of the boat says, oh, don't worry. It's only leaking in my part of the boat. Now, I love the story because in a situation like that, we all smile and we chuckle because we understand intuitively that a leak in any part of the boat is going to bring the whole thing down. And yet, in our world, it's so easy for us to feel separate from people suffering from problems. We are separate from those who are going hungry, we are suffering from those who don't have access to health care. We are separate from those who don't have access to education. And we are separate from those who defecate in the open. And we're separate from those who are suffering and dying due to the ramifications of what open defecation and lack of sanitation are doing to our water supply in our world. But as the story elucidates so beautifully, a leak anywhere is bringing the whole boat down. And that's really where we stand today. We stand in a situation where, as our ambassador from the United States this morning mentioned, 2.5 billion people in the world, it's more than a third of the world's population, don't have access to safe and sufficient water, sanitation, and hygiene. In India itself, about 1,600 children under the age of five perish every single day simply due to lack of water, sanitation, and hygiene. Can you imagine if someone held up 40 busloads of children, of kindergartners on their way to school, and shot those children dead, every one of them point blank range, what would the world's community do? We would stand up, we would join hands, and we would not just tweet about the problem, not just post about the problem, not just Facebook about the problem, not just blog about it, but yet we actually would do something about it. And if we knew that it was happening not just today, not just an isolated tragic occurrence, but that this was happening every day, and that tomorrow again it was going to happen, what would we do? We'd figure out how to find, capture, stop, and punish that villain. But that villain, sadly, is us. It's us through our actions, and it's us through our inactions. And that villain has come in the form, simply, 
of polluted water, lack of water, and lack of sanitary and hygiene facilities. That's the bad news. The good news is that we actually can do something about it. And that's what we are all coming together for and to do. More people perish every single year from water-related illnesses than from all forms of violence combined. So while we rally together against violence in the name of religion and we rally together against wars and against occupation and against invasions, and we rally together against crime in the in drug-induced crime. Take all of those forms of violence, add them together, and it's still fewer people than die simply due to water-related illnesses. When India became independent, there were about 35 crore people. Our rivers flowed beautifully and full. There was space at that time for people who wanted to use nature to heed their nature calls. Most of the farming was organic, the traditional form of farming in this country. The industrial shift in mindset, materialistic shift in mindset had not yet plagued India. Our land and our water could take people defecating outside. Today, we're at about 120 crore people. Our waters have been dammed. They've been diverted. They've been dragged out of their riverbeds. They're being used for agriculture because agriculture today is pouring toxic chemicals into the soil, which then leach into our waters industrial pollution, chemical pollution, due to our craving for more and more and more, newer and newer. Sewage from the increased population running into the rivers. Just into Ganga alone, more than a billion liters. And on top of that, we have 600 million people defecating in the open. Our water supply cannot handle it anymore. Our soil cannot handle it anymore. Open defecation, as Pooja Swamiji said so beautifully this morning, is total devastation. Not just devastation for our land and our water and our crops, which of course then become toxic, but devastation for the women who have to go outside. We've got a revolution of taking care of women in this country. And yet, they're raped, they're violated when they have to wait for the cover of dark to go outside. The dehydration they suffer from not drinking all day long so they don't have to go out. The stomach problems they suffer from holding it all day long. Our boat is sinking. In our culture, we say, Vasudev Kutumbakam, the world is one family. So that family includes all of those suffering and dying. It includes all of those having to brave the darkness of night to go outside to defecate. But even if, even if our spiritual inclination, our vision, does not accept that we're all a family. Our boat is still sinking because the ramifications of the lack of clean water, lack of sanitation, and lack of hygiene affect every one of us. The polluted water, the toxic soil, the toxic crops are to blame for skyrocketing rates of so many ailments and illnesses. What do we need? We're here talking about innovation. Innovation is one of the four eyes that we need. We need the information. We need to understand the problem. What is the problem? Why does it matter if I want to go to the toilet outside? Why does it matter if I dump my waste in the river? 
Then we need the inspiration. The inspiration to actually change our behavior. Whether the behavior of being an open defecator or whether being the behavior of one who sits back and watches while industry, while agriculture, while infrastructure renders our water undrinkable. Inspiration to create a social movement whereby open defecation becomes as unacceptable as socially unacceptable, as slavery, or as apartheid. Not in that long ago in history, slavery was not only common, but it was legal. Apartheid was legal. Not giving women the vote was legal. Today, you'd be a social pariah if you so much as insinuated that having a slave was okay, or denying women the vote was okay, or having separate drinking fountains for the white people and the colored people was okay. We need a social movement so that defecating in the open is not okay. And then we need the innovation, which actually, from what I saw today in the expo, we don't even need. We have it already. The innovation here just that which is being showcased downstairs is enough to change this country. And then lastly, and we'll speak more about all of this in the panel when we get into the details, we need implementation. Implementation from the government, implementation from NGOs, implementation from corporates, implementation from the media, Implementation from everyone who has the capacity in whatever sphere they work in to impact this social situation. When we all come together like this, there is no reason for even one person to suffer and die due to lack of water, sanitation, and hygiene. Lastly, when we look at other problems in the world, whether it's what's happening in the Middle East, whether it's violence and terrorism, there's so little we can do. We can pray. We can bring international interfaith leaders together. But there's so little that most of us in our individual or professional capacity can do. And yet this is one area where every one of us, in whatever our role is, has the ability to bring about change. And that, that is the concept of what the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance is doing co-founded by Pooja Swamiji, bringing together religious leaders of all of the different faiths from across the world to really inspire this change, to inspire governments, to inspire companies, corporates, media, and then, of course, to inspire the people, the masses, to change. Because we can inspire governments and corporations to build the toilets but we need to inspire the masses to use them and to create that demand such that defecating in the open or permitting open defecation becomes as much pop, as much sin, as all of that which our religions have always told us is sin. The sin of today is our lack of engagement with the problem. So I thank you all. I turn the mic back to Dr. Ashishji to lead us through the interactive session of the panel. <clears throat> thank you, Sadhviji. That is a very inspiring address, and I think it was really a compelling call to action. And in fact, when I think back on it, all the points that you laid out are points that different people in the panel, I've had a conversation with each one of them, is going to bring out. So thank you very much for giving such an over-encompassing 
opening session and really setting the context. What I want to do now is just spend two minutes giving an idea of how we're going to run the panel and then have the panelists come up. So basically, we are very fortunate. We've got some really, what should I say, people who are both content experts but can also think and express themselves well. And it's rare to have that kind of combination. But on the panel today, we have them. What I'm going to do is give a very brief introduction to each of them, ask them to come on. I'm going to give one framing question to each of them and then open it up to the audience for questions. Before that, I'm going to give a five minute presentation which is based on some of the work we have done because I think it will set the context for the session. So I'm going to ask for the presentation. So I think what's the key question here for all of us is really scale. And the second word I want to use is total sanitation, all aspects of sanitation, because it's a long-term permanent solution that we need. Next. <coughs> Should I have the this thing? Now, one of the things I just want to put in context here is we're here basically at Sankalp, whose focus has been impact investing. And the whole context there has been you've got these really great social entrepreneurs and innovators. If we can give them the space and often the money, they will solve all the world's problems. We've now been in the space for about 10 years. In fact, the group I worked with, Monitor Group, coined the word impact investing. Unfortunately, we have not gotten to scale on any of these solutions. And as we've looked back over the last eight years of the work we have done and the work other people have done, I think the one thing that has come out is that we are expecting too much of these social entrepreneurs to solve all the world's toughest problems at scale. And the reason for that is all the focus, if you see these four ovals, is on the left-hand side at something called the firm. That's fine. The firm has to have a really strong, interesting innovation and a business model to get it out there and scale. But there's only so much the firm can do. So let's say I'm actually constructing housing. If there's no one to finance the housing, how does the customer buy the house? So you need the value chain to be there. If I'm setting up schools, if there are no teachers, what am I going to do? So we need the inputs and the distribution, the full value chain, to make these innovations succeed. The second thing is what we call public good. I want to sell you a water filter, but you want to buy a mobile phone. I've got to give you the value of the water filter, so you buy the water filter today. Kids don't fall sick. You save the money by not going to doctors, and then you can buy a mobile phone tomorrow, and you have both. But that takes effort. And I, as a firm, if I do that, you get convinced, but then you go buy my competitor's water filter. So there's a major issue here about creating public good. And this is especially difficult for the socially more important issues. Everybody wants a mobile phone. Nobody wants insurance. Much fewer people want toilets, and I'll come back to toilets. Good cook stoves. And last but not the least is regulation. Government policies often are not conducive to creating social impact. Even when they're well-meaning, the actual implementation doesn't work. So I'm just flagging this because this is going to be the context of today's panel. What is the ecosystem around sanitation? And how do we address those ecosystem issues to get to a total sanitation solution at scale? But I'm also just going to say for those of you who are interested in this as a more intellectual issue about how do you really address ecosystem barriers, uh, the group I work with, which was uh, the monitor group, but our whole unit has now merged with FSG. We've written a report on it called Beyond the Pioneer. Anybody who wants it, please feel free, give me a card, we'll email you a copy. We're being eco-friendly, so we're not handing out copies, but anybody who wants it is welcome to it. But I just want to set that context up for the panel itself. Sorry. Now, the rural sanitation context has already been set up by Sadhviji in many ways. Over 60% of rural households in India do not have access to a good, safe toilet. At the same time, let's not pretend the government doesn't know about it. Government knows about it, has been trying to do a lot. What's interesting is the government has constructed 78 million toilets. What's even more interesting data, the census says there are 51 million toilets in rural India that are working. And estimates from people like Dean Spears, etc., say that when they go out and see toilets, most of those toilets, in fact, 75% is his estimate, are constructed completely by the private sector. There was no government subsidy, there was no government support. So if you have 25% or even 30% of 51, we're talking of 17, 18 million toilets. 78 million were constructed. Where's the missing 60? What I want to point out is not where's the missing 60, but let's focus on the positive. 40 million by the private sector. 
The private sector today is constructing toilets. If you look at materials, anywhere in this country you can get a pan, you can get sand, you can get all the materials for a toilet. The issue is actually getting them out there and using them. So that's really what I want to focus on is how do we leverage the private sector in a broader context to actually get this and that's what the panel will focus on. Um, just some very quick data which again feeds back very much to what Sadhviji was saying. Uh, we did some work in Bihar, I won't go into all the details, five month detailed on the ground analysis, uh, over a thousand customers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is interesting was when we talked to people, do they want toilets? 84% of households wanted a toilet. What is interesting was the reason, it wasn't health. As Sadhviji said, 49% is because of safety. Women unfortunately have to go to the toilet before the break of day or after dawn. Not the safest thing to be done. The second driver was convenience. Old people, somebody's got diarrhea. You need to go middle of the day, where do you go? And the third reason, 24% was privacy, or what I would really call honesty to be more modesty. When girls turn 16 or 14, suddenly the parents want a toilet in the house. So it's not health, but let me also, let's also be clear, there is some demand. It may not be from the people we look for, but at some level it is from the people who are the most needy. Second finding, a toilet in rural India today costs about 40,000 for a septic tank, which what people want. Low cost, pseudo septic tanks cost 20,000. Many people can't afford it. But there are solutions. Again, you guys have seen innovations in the hall down below. We've seen innovations all over the country. You can have a good, basic, durable toilet that people want for about 10, 12,000 rupees. Um, I won't go into the details of the design. Happy to share with anyone who wants it later. The interesting thing is, even with that, how many people can buy it outright? Maybe another 6, 8% of the rural population. Again, not small numbers when you think of India. But more can afford it if they could get financing. So the interesting thing here is, if you can enable financing for toilets, you open up a much larger market. On top of that, if you can give a small subsidy, 4,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees, that opens up another 40% of the market. And then for the last 50%, they really don't have much money. They're going to need a lot of help. But what I want to paint a picture here is that, and incidentally, one of the things here is financing for sanitation. We are fortunate we have Suresh with us, who leads a microfinance organization, which is actually financing toilets, and I'll come back to that in his introduction. But I just want to lay out the context here that people want it. Technology solutions are available. Business model innovations like financing actually do happen. And it's a pretty large market. If we can get this going, we're talking of basically a 10 to $14 billion market. The challenge is how. And that's really what I want to get the panel to focus on. And in that sense, I want to again just put out, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but the ecosystem barriers in sanitation. This is based on some of the work we did with the World Bank, WSP. I'll just talk a few. In the value chain, one of the problems today is even when toilets do get constructed, they're expensive and they're poor quality. How do we get good quality systematically into the sector? Another problem is financing. Suresh is there, 100,000, not enough. We need 100 million. Small order of magnitude out there. If I move into the public goods, there's the whole issue of even if there is demand, why, do, why does everybody in the house not use it? Why is it only the women folk who are using it? There's a bigger issue of behavior change. Moving into government, end of the day, the money is there. It's not getting to the people. We need to find ways of channeling it. This, we're not poor. We have enough money today for these kinds of issues. It's the choices we make and the implementation. There's also a big education piece. You have an IAS officer who comes in, poor chap knows nothing about it, and he's supposed to take care of this in the next three years and move on. And across the value chain, and in fact, uh, Rajiv, who does not seem, I'm not sure he's here, Rajiv Kher was part of the panel. Oh, it's there, great. Um, it's gonna be talking about that. So I don't wanna take more time. I've already taken more time than I'd wanted. But I want to lay out that we have 45 minutes. I'm going to give a half a minute introduction to each of the panelists. In fact, I'm going to ask them to come on and then I'm going to introduce them. One question to each panelist. Let's keep it to about five minutes each. So we'll have another 20 minutes and then we have 25 minutes for the audience. And for the audience, I'm going to make two suggestions. One is just in terms of the format, give your name and keep your question or your observation brief. There are lots of interesting people here you want to benefit from them. Second is the context. We're talking of total sanitation at scale. So if you in your experience in any way have come across or think about ecosystem barriers we need to address, if you can highlight those, if you have ideas to solve them, great. If you don't have ideas, that's fine. We've got a great panel. But give the 
thoughts about the ecosystem. What I will do is I'll bundle up questions and ask them from the panel as a group rather than each one individually, just in the interest of time. With that, I'd like to ask the panelists to come on board and then I will introduce each of them. So I must say it's one level when I was asked to moderate this panel, I was thrilled because I know each of these panelists in some way or have a connection to them. As I mentioned with Sadhviji, we went to the same university. Bhavna has been heading up WSP's learning, it's called the Learning Leadership Innovation Initiative in India, LLI. It's an interesting part of the World Bank because it realizes that everything is not about giving loans, but actually helping, first of all, build capability. And across sectors, not just the government, but across sectors. The second thing, so that's the... Um, leadership aspect, there's a learning aspect to it, then there's an innovation aspect. Bhavna actually now heads up LLI in India, and she also is in charge of the development marketplace, or at least was, I don't know if you're still doing that, but that's also another part of us. And she's the key lead on the Swachh Bharat uh, mission as far as the World Bank is concerned on the LLI. So thank you very much for being with us today, Bhavna. I'm not going to introduce Sadhvi anymore because I did already, and in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to Suresh, another old friend who has been running a microfinance organization called Grameen Kuta. What's interesting is while Grameen is one of the Kuta's, one of the big sort of MFIs in this country and everybody looks upon them as one of the sort of role models, what I think people know less about is that Suresh has really been driven by social impact. So he has been using Grameen Kuta as a platform to do some really interesting stuff, whether it is work on cook stoves, which I first came across him doing about six years ago, to sanitation, to a bunch of different areas, it's been really an amazing journey that he's been on. Just on the sanitation, some very quick numbers. They've started giving out loans on sanitation. And right now, if I remember correctly, they're running at about 1,000 to 2,000 loans a week. They've given out 100 crores in loans. And guess what their repayments are? Anybody want to take a stab in the audience? Not quite, 99.4. <laughs> but basically, it's as good as any of the other product lines that they have, which is quite interesting because it's not a quote con quote, income generating or consumption loan. Um, I'm going to move on to the last member of the panel, uh, Rajiv, who is, as he very succinctly puts it, he's the entrepreneur who started the first professionally scaled portable sanitation and waste management company, which encompasses a bunch of very different areas. So firstly, there's a thing which I have known them for, which is the temporary portable toilets. But what's interesting is they not only do the temporary portable toilets, but really creates, create services all the way from installation to cleaning to maintenance, the full nine yards in this space, which I think is important because people focus too much on one piece and not the whole solution that is required. And now with the biodigester coming out and some of the innovations on the technology side, actually saying given he can handle the whole value chain, looking at that as a core technology element and putting it all together. So Rajiv, very welcome to have you here. And uh, what I'm going to do is, as I mentioned, I'm first going to ask each of the panelists a question, and then after that we'll open it up to the audience. I'm just going to sit down and see this if you guys don't mind. So the first question which is going to be for everyone is, We've been talking about total sanitation and sanitation at scale. If you can reflect back on your experience in this space and tell us about, A, what do you think are the one or two biggest problems in the ecosystem that need to be thought about? And if you have any ideas on how to actually address them, that would be fantastic. So I'm going to start actually with Rajiv at the end of the table. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. So I think one of the biggest problems that uh, that we faced as a practitioner and for the last 15 years that we're in this space is uh, the biggest one is awareness. Uh, awareness in, uh, in terms of like you rightly said that you know you have a young IS officer who comes by and then uh, he's going to be there for three years. He probably is from the revenue department but now you know put in charge of uh, the entire city management. And uh, he's been told you have to make toilets, you have to do this, that and the other and when you realize that he has really no expertise in, in sanitation. And in India, I think primarily over here, uh, sanitation normally, 
of course, this is it's not today, but what I'm speaking about is much before uh, our Prime Minister launched this Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. But before this, sanitation was never really priority. So, you know, when, when you talk about even organizing an event, like you have the Kumbh Mela, you have uh, large events. Like when I'm talking about events, I'm talking about massive events, you know, where thousands, millions of people gather. The last thing on the agenda is toilets. And toilets is like a bad word. Nobody wants to discuss it even. So, like, in, in a, you know, on a dining table, if you start talking about toilets, somebody says, don't talk about toilets and all this, let, you know, do it after dinner is over. That's culturally how we are, you know, we never want to talk about uh, sanitation, which is what needs to change. So the question of awareness is that this, this IS officer or this local official needs to be educated in a way that, look, there are these standards that are available. There are these systems that need to be followed. This is the waste disposal mechanism option that is available. Uh, the form of... Uh, Construction of toilet needs to be modern, which is you can use modern material as is available today. Then use a 1940 design, which was made by the PWD or by whatever government department. So you need to have modern systems, which he is aware of. So to start off with awareness is the biggest problem. I think that needs to be created, not just with people around, but also with the officials who are going to be running these programs. Uh, the second one, other than awareness, is uh, I think this is a, is a bigger problem is uh, you know, it is, is um, creating a kind of uh, uh, interface between the people and uh, the interface between the people and these officials. So uh, it's a part of education, but it's also something which people need to realize that standardization is important. You know, so for example, uh, if you're told that, look, this is a, this is a public toilet, so you have four urinals, you have five toilets, and this is what you have. Nobody is even bothered to check what is the standard that this toilet has. There is no legislation, there is no standardization, which I feel is extremely important. So no matter what comes in, if you don't have legislation and you don't have standardization, you will see shoddy toilets being built, you will see people still defecating in the open because there is no legislation. So there has to be a legislation, a standardization and an awareness. So that's something which I've learned over the last 15 years. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Suresh, your thoughts? Yeah. Thanks, Ashish, uh, for giving that. I think a lot, actually, Dr. Sadviji actually mentioned, I mean, laid out a full picture of the issue of toilets, which we have been uh, facing day to day, every day. Behavioral change is the critical thing. I mean, he already mentioned, so I will not try to uh, repeat that again, because that's something which every day in out, we actually face that. I mean, I can put a number of examples why behavioral change becomes important. Just to give, illustrate one, so that so to say it will help set the contest. I've got case studies, or uh, the mother-in-law doesn't use this toilet because the daughter-in-law uses using it. Okay, now you tell me what what do we do when we come out with a story like that? The father-in-law doesn't use this because the daughter-in-law using it. So we have all these kind of issues which go around. It has really happened. It was people actually have told me right in front of my face. So. Uh, if you analyze these things, you know, where, where is the issue? I mean, one is uh, your behavioral change, the perception of a uh, whole lot of our uh, traditions and family systems, what we had in our country. That's another big change which we need. How do we make this change is a big uh, challenge which I every day go through. We did all kinds of things. We do awareness programs, show videos, do workshops, do uh, uh, take walks in the villages or the towns, get all the... Uh, uh, celebrities to talk about it. Yeah, it's all good and fun. It will happen one day and next day uh, life is as usual. I mean, that's where I feel. So there is a need for continuation. So we need to continue to uh, engage with those families. It'll t it's a time-taking one. I mean, so that's what we need to be, what, what I feel we need to do. As a microfinance institution, yes, I mean, we have uh, done, actually, Ashish, the numbers are about 200,000 now. Uh, because you had made that slide, I remember yes. some months remember. back. And made the, we, have, we have given about 200,000 toilets. A lot of people used to tell me, hey, you can't give a loan to a toilet and people will not take it, number one. And second one is, hey, they will never be able to repay back. That's a standard, uh, ask anybody, they'll all say that. But actually, my experience has been completely different. I've been giving loans because I don't have any free money. I am borrowing from the banks. That's the money which I have. The moment I borrow, I have to pay interest to the bank. Bank is not giving me any free money. So I have only that money because a lot of uh, women, because we work we lend, as a microfinance institution, we lend only to women. Women were demanding they need uh, 
uh, money for the construction of the toilets. So we landed up giving uh, uh, as an experiment to few people where we never had any repayment issues. Then became the challenge, how do I, when the demand increase, where do I get that money? So then people start questioning, uh, you're charging high interest rate on that. You know, for a toilet, how can you charge it? But what do I do when this is the money available? Uh, if given a ch chance, of course, I would like to give it free, but that's not the, how the world works today. Everything is counted. Everybody, there is a cost attached to everything. So we started giving loans, and today it has, we have done more than 200,000 toilet loans, about 100,000 water connection or water purifiers uh, loans to people, and people have been repaying. We have lent about maybe about 150, 200 crores of rupees towards only this. Of course, as a microfinance institution, if you look at, it's, a, it's about 10% of our overall portfolio. It's not a very big one, but it's still a pretty sizable loan. So my two things is, uh, this continuing to engage with the community so that the change is what is the need of the art. The second one is there are a lot of local leaders who are there, and people who get inspired and then try to influence others in the local area. How do we build them? How do we build their capacity? And how do we increase the numbers uh, of such kind of a people is another area which we need to uh, probably look at. Because all of us have limited resources and limited time, so we need we need to probably like have more ambassadors for this uh, sanitation issue. Recently, I did see the government of India came out with an uh, ad campaign, which comes in some part of the television. I don't know what hour. I just accidentally saw it one day. I was quite uh, impressed. In fact, I was thinking somebody should do that, but they have come in. But it's hardly aired maybe a few times a day. And I don't know how many people will see that particular television channel to actually get inspired. That's the challenge. So, of course, they have got the celebrity Vidya Balan to actually come and talk about sanitation. It's good, but is it enough? No way. I don't know how many... She talks in Hindi. I mean, down south, probably nobody understands Hindi. So, what do we do? So, we need to have more campaign. I think we need to get into the campaign more. We need to create a lot of momentum that we should make it as one single agenda in the nation so that we drive towards sanitation. Uh, I stop here because there's so many things to say, but I think... I'm sure you all understand it because it's a, uh, it's a long journey we have, but it's an important thing what we all need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Bhavna, can I ask you to yeah. share your thoughts? Sure. sure. Thank you. I think uh, uh, Sadhviji's uh, very, very inspiring uh, uh, introduction, and, and I think uh, Ashish is your, your sort of very comprehensive presentation has thrown into some very important uh, uh, issues, uh, which I think is, is the real challenge we all of us are collectively facing. The two phrases to pick up, one you talked about ecosystem, and the other is the scale and how do we all collectively rally towards achieving these is the real issue that I'm seeing. So when you talk about ecosystem and your question about what is one issue, it's difficult to pick up one issue to say what is that one issue, is the finance the biggest challenge, is demand the biggest challenge. I think we have to have a multi-pronged approach to address all these issues of ecosystem together with an absolute focus and speed. I think our key challenge is also the speed at which we need to do. Our experience shows that all the supply pushed programs in the last two decades have shown very little results on the ground. And to me, therefore, unless something is demanded, cell phone is demanded, latest technologies are demanded, so money doesn't become an issue, technology barrier doesn't become an issue, then demand has to happen. And I think demand creation is the biggest issue. Um, I think my previous two panel, uh, uh, panelists, colleagues over here, have talked about how on the ground, there are social cultural issues, there are barriers to why people don't think toilet is important and talk about toilet. But I think now is the time. We need to actually be absolutely comfortable talking about the sanitation issues on a dinner table, on a lunch table. What does it really mean when we talk about, and I really again pick up the, you know, one of the eyes that uh, Sadhviji uh, mentioned about beginning with information. I think there is a huge, information and understanding gap between the communities and masses at large. What we find in our set of research that have been done through the various studies conducted by different parts of the World Bank group is people do not connect 
safe sanitation with hygiene. In fact, it's considered that a toilet in my house is more unhygienic because I do not have the water to clean, I do not have you know, facilities, and the burden of cleaning is on the women. So therefore, there are a lot of real issues which we sitting here in Delhi think intuitively should make a connection, but it does not make a connection. And this information cannot just be, be flown through one Vidya Balanad. It has to be the local communities. The, the change leaders in the communities who can make that change. And, and I think we have to have that kind of a form to be able to start beginning to talk about the demand side. The second thing I would say is in the ecosystem is once we create that demand, there need to be somebody who's going to then pull together these different pieces of ecosystem together. I think we work in our silos. Somebody is looking at financial challenges. Somebody is really focused on the technology issue. Somebody else goes as a sort of an NGO on the ground trying to ramp up the demand. But when these are done in isolation and not in an integrated manner in the value chain, what suffers is the outcome. Because I've created the demand, but then I don't know where to go and collect the finance from. So who's going to play that integrator role? Somebody has to start playing and saying, beyond my area, which may be a finance or a technology, I need to do finance plus plus. I need to do technology plus plus. And I think we need to create more such sort of, and I think we're talking in a, in, 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 a, in a forum where social entrepreneurs with the object of social impact being more important than financial returns is coming up. And I think we have to start looking at how do we create that social impact and how do you create that integrators to come through. I'd only like to say, if you're talking about scale, I think we have to think about scale. We continue to talk about scale, but work, implement, and think in our little villages, in our group of sort of you know communities. And I think that's the barrier we need to break, as Sadhviji mentioned. We cannot be in just our part of the boat. But then who's going to play that connector role? I think that's the biggest challenge I see, that how do we all come together to be able to make that connection happen, that, that we can leverage each other's strengths to be able to move forward on this, this very critical uh, uh, agenda. I'd only like to say that I think um, there are enough success stories. There are enough success stories. You go to villages who've done fabulous jobs, I think that information just doesn't flow. And I think we do see as a role as a part of the World Bank group to see how do we connect those dots, how do you quickly make that information flow, knowledge flow, for the people to be able to see the value in, in, in what uh, uh, benefits they can get out of moving to a safe and sustained sanitation. And I would say, let's not just talk about toilets construction. Let's talk about a collective movement for using those toilets and not just building them as storehouses or using them for just the daughter and the mother to be, to be able to use it. I think our biggest challenge is our communication has to be targeted towards men. I think a lot of them still feel toilet is just for the women in the house and leave it at that. And, and a large number of men actually continue to go out and open, defecate in the open. So those are some of the shifts we would need, is what I would say as, as the biggest set of challenge to address the broader ecosystem issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Sadhviji, I'd like you to you open the session, you lay out a set of high level thoughts and just specifics you'd like to dig a little deeper into. We'd love to get your thoughts. Sure, thanks Ashishji. I think the challenges have been laid out so eloquently and beautifully. Rather than repeating them, I just actually thought, let me respond to a couple of the challenges that have been raised and speak about some solutions that I have seen that we're working with and then take it from there. First, in terms of the concept, as Bhavanaji was just speaking about the information and getting it out there, you know, I remember when I first moved to Rishikesh, and it's this very holy place where people come from all over the world to see Ganga and have a bath in Ganga. And then you'd see people who would spend their last rupees and God knows how many days or weeks to get to Rishikesh. They would then spend whatever spare pocket change they had, they'd skip lunch, they'd buy flowers to offer to Ganga, 
And then when they offered the flowers into Ganga, they'd offer the plastic bag that the flowers came in. And it was this incredible irony and paradox because people would say, see, look, they don't care. And that, of course, never made sense to me, because if they didn't care, they wouldn't bother to come. And if they didn't care, they would have gone for lunch instead of taking their lunch money to go and buy the flowers. So clearly, they did care. And what you realize when you speak to these people, you know, you'll, you'll go across the river by boat, and people who are leaving Rishikesh are still filled with such bhav that as the boat's going, they're performing arti to Ganga with the incense sticks, and then taking the cardboard box that the incense sticks came in and dumping it in Ganga. And so when you speak to them, what you realize is it's the exact opposite of apathy. It's the exact opposite of indifference. To them, the idea that Ganga can't handle a plastic bag and can't handle a cardboard box, that's sacrilege. I mean, the look on people's faces when you so much as suggest that this plastic bag is polluting Ganga makes you feel like you've just committed this horribly sacrilegious act to even suggest it. And so then the educational campaigns that Puja Swamiji has started and has run, whether in the community, through the media, in schools, is a campaign that's not about Ganga can't handle your plastic bag, but a campaign that says, OK, Ganga is, as we all believe, divine and pure and untaintable and unpollutable. But see, the fish swim into this plastic bag. And then they suffocate and die because their gills can't open. Or the plastic bags wash up down river and the cows eat it and then the cows suffocate and die. And then suddenly people say, oh. So I think along with getting the message out, we have to really figure out what message works, what message appeals to the sensibilities of the people. We can come in from outside and give messages about the polluted state of Ganga. But what you get is the exact opposite response that we want from people, which is basically, how dare you say that? So that's not where we want to be. We want them to understand that we're working for the solution. So it becomes just about sort of a changing of the semantics of the message into one that people actually relate with. Another piece you mentioned about the Kumbh Mela is that this is where the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance has been so committed and is actually starting to show some really great progress, is if you get faith leaders involved, you know, about a Literally, almost 100% of Indians identify as belonging to a faith group. So if you can get all of the faith communities together to really start speaking about this, that's a way to get the message to literally trickle down. And you get faith leaders talking about, literally, what is pop, and talking about what is peace, and talking about what's part of our daily daily duties, daily task. And so, for example, with the Kumb, we have actually partnered already with Fiki and DRDO and BHEL now to put in biodigester toilets in the whole Kumbamela zone all the way from Haridwar up to Dave Prayag. In the Allahabad Kumbamela in 2001, in the, sorry, 2013, the Mahakumb, we 2001 also, but then the just recent one, we were doing very, very wide-scale cleanup programs, which thankfully the media covered wonderfully, so other people started seeing, then other ashrams and other sampradayas also started doing it. So you literally had saints out there shoveling, picking up trash, every VIP, everyone who came to our Kumbh Mela camp, it was about take a bag, come out, we're cleaning up trash. So that is all very, very, very possible. It brings me just to the last point that I wanted to mention when speaking about the toilets. And the only challenge I think that we haven't addressed yet 
is the lack of water. And it's very, very difficult to properly run toilets in a way where they can stay clean, where they don't smell horrendously. In the difficult water situations that we already face and the even more difficult water situations we're going to face as climate change and as water shortages become really part of our day-to-day -day life. And for that, the biodigester toilets that DRDO had come up with, had constructed, are such a fabulous solution because they use such a little water. And what they give back is not only gray water that can then be used in agriculture, but you actually can turn them into energy producers um, with methane, with the biogas, with all of that. So they actually become not only toilets solving a sanitation problem, but solutions solving even an energy problem, which hopefully someday could even be utilized instead, for example, of damming up the rivers and exacerbating the issue of low dilution of water in our rivers. Thank you. We have about 17 minutes left open for questions. So I'm going to ask people to, uh, someone with a mic out here? Yeah, if you could just, oh, you have mics. Um, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Meena Vaidyanathan. I run an uh, organization called Neeti Consulting. Um, one of the, uh, and uh, Bhavna, this is for you, and Satviji for you. You raised two very, very important points. Uh, one about, uh, you know, awareness, and awareness not just directed at women, but men. And one about awareness that goes beyond what is obvious. You know, and, and bringing uh, people who are, you know, about interfaiths, faith leaders, etc. I wanted to share an experience of uh, one of the projects that we worked in Jharkhand last year. Is um, there after after the Swachh Bharat campaign? You know, all these um, as part of the CSR programs, a lot of corporates got into the flurry of you know creating toilets to spend their CSR money, and in two particular villages within 20 kilometers of each other there have been 20 toilets that were built, uh, and very good uh, toilets, clean, maintained, whatever. And six months later, when I went back for in, in, in connection with another project, found that four of them were locked. They were in sets of two, so 10 toilets in one village and 10 in another. Uh, four of them were locked in that block of 10, where only six were available. I was very curious, and I sort of tried to probe as to why and found out that the four were uh, earmarked for the Thakurs and the uh, Sarpanj and their families. So four toilets for a family of you know, roughly eight to 10 people, and the six for a population of another 500. Um, so I think uh, one is a very important point about uh, taking the communication beyond to interfaith leaders, to men, but I think it also, uh, I think we also need to bring in the issue of caste and uh, economic, uh, you know, disparity that is inherent in our cultural fabric, to say. So I, I mean, it's, I know many of you sort of brought it out, but I wanted to share this, you know, and it's, it's very recent and um, it, it shocked me. And I wanted to share this and wanted to bring this out in the debate that it goes beyond faith, goes beyond gender. And I think it sort of needs to address different Good cultural Good point. Areas. Question there with Manas back there. Go ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ashish. Um, you know, we talk a lot about behavior change. Um, a lot of behavior change communication across the world on cigarettes, for example, has had some impact on educated, middle class, upper middle class consumption. But in public spaces, they took a regulation that you cannot smoke in public, you cannot smoke in restaurants, bars, etc. There's a huge outcry, how can you do that, right? But it helps, it helps health, it helps air quality, it helps a lot of things. What are we doing where we make it a part of the regulation? And of course, the implementation issues, and we can you know, all talk about that and be cynical or be optimistic. But uh, what happens if we make open defecation illegal after a point of time when enough support, both financial, etc., has been provided? to give every house the chance to build their own toilet. Uh, what happens if from the top, there are demands that certain targets be set at a district, village, city level, slum-wise, 
uh, you know, backed by proper data and mapping so that you don't have issues where 10 toilets get locked up and they're disused, etc. Now, we have the technology, and I agree with you completely, that we have all the technology we need in the world. You know, we really don't need more technology. Uh, but, you know, I think we need control mechanisms, we need regulations, we need systems and accountability to make these things happen and treat, you know, as Ashish said, this is, this is a public issue. Uh, it's not just about you not using the toilet, it affects everybody. It's a hole in the boat. Um, but why are we not seeing more action around that front and everyone runs around jumping, saying behavior change, behavior change, crying, oh no, behavior change, no behavior change is happening. Why can't we force people, whether they like it or not, to do certain things, just like I can't drive around a car that pollutes, can't smoke in public, why can I still go and you know defecate on the sidewalk of a major street of Bombay and nobody's going to stop me? Thank you. Uh, questions, and again, I'm going to ask people, uh, two of you asked you in the first row to start, but again, say if you can think about the ecosystem issues and link back to that, that'd be great. All right. So my name is Risha Bhatia. I uh, represent an organization called Swachh Saman Ready Made Toilets. I think we claim to be the cheapest toilet manufacturer in India, where we manufacture toilets starting 13,000 rupees, including everything, delivery, installation, one pit tank, ABC, everything. So I beg to differ with some of the uh, facts that have been stated here. In the last three months, I think I've traveled about a couple of hundred villages of Rajasthan. The problem that I faced was not of culture change. You give them a toilet, they'll start using it. It's more convenient. We have to make them get used to it. Any amount of theory, any amount of discussion is not going to get into their uh, knowledge base into their understanding until and unless they see the product, use it a couple of times, start using it. We struggled majorly, even at a cost of 13,000 where government was financing 12,000, we struggled majorly with getting the 12,000 because the Gram Panchayat issues a check to the Labarti, the beneficiary, and then we had to take it from the beneficiary. When we went to the government, we told them to do a direct tie-up. The beneficiary has no problem, they did not agree. Well, the government is like, no, no, we can't do all of this. We want the toilets, we have a lot of pressure, but we can't do this mechanism. This mechanism enables the beneficiary to pay just 1,000 and get the toilet made, but the government doesn't want to do it. And the, uh, the guy, who, the beneficiary doesn't want to pay 13,000 upfront. So that's where we need people like you, sir. So I'll talk to you after, about this later on. But the problem is we don't have, like ma'am said, a central organization. I went to the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation. I had to bribe 100 bucks for the guy to give me a slip to get in. I eventually did that. When I went in, I spoke to the director. I spoke to other people. They, they said, you know, just go and sell your toilet to people. There are too many people like you coming up. So even the good ventures get sidelined. I have a patented technology where we make not plastics, not sheet metal. We make ready-made hard stone toilets where compressive strength of walls is stronger than brick and mortar. No need for mason, no need for uh, cement, no water construction, no nothing. These are the challenges that people face. They can build toilets. They don't get masons. They don't get cement. Who will do it? What will the, the Ministry of Drinking Water has to be that nodal organization which connects me to people like you. So I can come up to you and, you know, there should be a central database. There is no such thing happening. Thank you. One behind. I am Ranjit Sinha and I come from a horrible state called Bihar, which you have been mentioning, Jharkhand has been mentioned. Anyway, jokes apart, I, uh, chose, I have chosen to live in a village. I have been there for the last 25 years and I have been working with women and children. And as a part of the whole thing, we have been also working with men. And we have tried to find out solutions, local problems. And this toilet business has been, a, has been bothering us for the last 15 years. And over a period of time, we have developed a lot of toilets. I'm going to say something positive, you know, not... I made it a point to involve the people in manufacturing their own toilets as per a design in ferro cement and they became our ambassadors they make the toilets themselves they don't come to us anymore they are making the toilets we only go and help them check it out now this was an informal kind of a thing going on and since this uh, where such bharat abhiyan has started uh, what we are trying to do this is i'm talking about positive things i'm not trying to uh, say anything against what you have said because it's a fact that speed business has become very important. We have created a demand and we are not able to supply. So why don't we make these people stakeholders in the manufacture as well? Help them in providing centralized, you know, that spoken wheel affair. Uh, we give them the materials and they are manufactured and we only go and test the quality. So once a week my man goes, sees, a lady goes, checks out. 
Now the point is what has hap what has happened? There is skill development, there is empowerment, women's empowerment, there is employment, there is sanitation, and there is a toilet, and that is being used, and it takes only two liters of water also. As a bonus, what we do is, if there are 50 toilets built in a village, we give them a pump. And we don't take any money from the government. We are not subsidized. We have no grants. We have worked with HUDCO and we got an initial grant of 5 lakh rupees 25 years ago, 24 years ago, and that is our starting capital. I do not believe that any amount of grant or uh, things will work unless there is passion and that is what is going to drive this whole experience is passion and once you have passion you can make a change. Huh? I am sorry I have taken up a lot of time and you want to give your perspective. I think passion is important. Swamiji I think you want to say a few words. I think part of the answer our Ranjit Sina has given this we are also trying in that line. Second is uh, the behavioral change we are talking about. Uh, that's why we started this uh, Global Interfaith Wash Alliance. I have talked to the chief of Sikhism, uh, the chief Jatidhar Saab and his team, and I'm very uh, happy to inform you and give you this information that they are first in the first pl place, they said we cannot talk these kind of things. And slowly in second meeting, third meeting and fourth meeting and they said why don't you prepare some information in Punjabi in Guru Mukhi and we will share with all and we will invite you there. Now, three days ago I talked to the head of the Shia community and uh, talked to the Hindu community. There is a place in Lucknow, Nadwa. Near Nadwa there is a university. This Nadwa university, then the Hindu university, this uh, Lucknow university. We found the place that uh, there is a, mon a monkey bridge between the both. Let us, I said, start building toilets and cleaning program. You will not believe it. In the beginning, there was not a response. Now, he said, why don't we set a date? Let us work together, all Muslim and Hindu community together, building toilets and cleaning them also. And the tree plant and many other things. So what I'm trying to say, let us give a beginning. And these leaders have a great, great stake in the community. People, even today, in spite of all, people believe in them. People take them very seriously. And that's why when now we are thinking in the Kumbha Mela, we are bringing this, all these top spiritual leaders together and giving the Sankalpa. Let the Global Sankalpa Summit also come there. And we can have a one summit there, Global Sankalpa, where 60 to 90 million people will be there for the period of three months. And we are putting, 50 to 100 big, big screens, these LED walls and everything, and making the films also. And uh, that every day in the Kumbh Mela, we're talking about toilet, toilet, toilet. Can you believe it? But it's going to happen. So many other things also uh, in uh, Nasik and in the Madhya Pradesh, things are happening last. Now, coming back to you, this, uh, as you said, you have a technology. We'll talk to you immediately if it's workable. We'll give you the order for immediately 500 toilets and we start with that and we'll see how it takes and uh, then today 4 o'clock I'm meeting with uh, the education minister of India HRD and uh, we are talking about only toilet that if you are building toilet millions of toilets in every school why not build bio toilets where less water no water and the same water you can use it and third is you can use the sludge and I have seen in our own ashram we did it and yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, the Suresh Prabhu was in our ashram. Every railway station we are planning now equipped with bio toilet and cleanliness program and we started it two days ago. Same thing. Then we have a meeting with Uma Bharti ji. She is the minister for water. Uh, water resources. Huh? Water resources. Water resources. And uh, same thing we are talking to her also, how all along the Ganga, 250, uh, 2500 kilometers, every 500 meters, why not we can provide GPS, Ganga, Parivar, Sevak. I know that in the plans there is exploitation, but in, with the feeling of Parivar, 
Ganga Action Parivar, we said GPS, Ganga Parivar Sevak. Every 500 meter, we made a huge plan for that, that we will have a GPS, Ganga Parivar Sevak, equipped with GPS. We are making a special software for that, that that one person can bring an amazing change, I'm telling you, the way we have planned everything. And that the girl is sitting here, our lady, making the film also for those GPS. And I think these things can bring change very fast. And if you can do it in a planned way, to me, failing to plan is planning to fail. I think with the World Bank, with the world's Global Sankalp Summit, FIKI, DRDO, and all, all of you, we can bring this change very soon. I am very hopeful and very positive. These leaders are ready. Lead the world. And we need you. Thank you. Deepika, one last question, and then I'm going to actually ask the panelists to give. Go ahead and brief, please. Yes. Um, thank you, Swamiji. Uh, taking from your cue of uh, failing to plan is a plan to fail. Um, as we are talking about uh, sort of ending open defecation and moving, you know, uh, doing behavior change campaigns to get people to use toilets, I want us to think also about, uh, you know, treatment of those uh, of the sludge that we are creating. Um, because uh, that is going to be a problem that we'll be facing. One of the things I am not yet aware of is uh, the ability of these biotoilets to actually be pathogen free and I would like to learn more about if it actually sort of treats it because otherwise all we're doing is moving from openly defecating to openly defecating but in our privacy. So I would like the panelists to sort of shed a light on that. Thank you. I'm sorry, I know there are more questions but I'm going to actually ask. Change, uh, I think we've now basically got five minutes left. Yeah, I'm going to ask every uh, panelist to just answer one question. I've chosen the questions a little bit on purpose to be different. So I'm going to ask Rajiv one minute on the lack of connections between the departments and the different people working in this space. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that I also uh, want to comment on is, uh, you know, it does not mean that sasta hai to hai. You know, so you need to realize that just because it's cheap doesn't necessarily mean that the poor people deserve something cheap. Uh, we need to provide something that is durable, something that is sustainable and something that you can use for a long period of time. Uh, you know, and that's something in our country which is lacking. I can give you an example when I go to various departments and I ask them about, uh, you know, uh, we make polyethylene 100% recyclable toilets. We also make ferro cement toilets. So Mr. Sinha has uh, been gracious enough to work with us. Uh, when we provide these toilets, people say, oh, so how much does it cost? That's the first question. It's not how, what is the efficacy of the product or what is the efficacy of the system? They'll say, how much does it cost? And when I say that it's, we don't sell, we'll rent it out to you for this price. We'll provide the cleaning, we'll do everything and we'll make sure that the waste is disposed of responsibly. The first question is, no, no, we want chahiye. It's not a question of we want something that's durable, that's good. We want something that's cheap. So the first thing which I mentioned earlier is awareness along with standardization following into legislation, extremely crucial. And to answer your question about the creating that link between uh, the government officials and between uh, practitioners like us, uh, social impact entities like ours, and the NGOs and World Bank and, uh, and, and uh, organizations uh, such as yours, Sadhviji, what we need to create is a huge awareness program. The I, I insist that people need to be educated across the across the board. I mean, it doesn't have to be an ex-party or you know whether you are in a government department or whatever it is. But we need to create a mechanism. We need to create a system where everybody is educated about quality. Everybody is educated about the importance of hygiene. And like Deepika said rightly, that waste management is extremely crucial in this whole process. And I, I, I completely agree with the fact that it just begins from awareness and probably ends at awareness. Thank you. Suresh, the question for you is a different one. It's basically, as a person who's actually financing toilets, how do you think about technologies? We've heard about ferro cement technology, we've heard about sort of ready sort of stone kind of toilets. So just get your like thoughts on how do you actually think about technology? See, uh, I think these are two things uh, which we, we will not be able to put it together when we are financing. So I need to think like a financer and only uh, lend money. Uh, I would not advise people what kind of toilet they need to build. But I'm ready to provide different information about various kinds of toilet you need to provide. Because if, I mean, these are, uh, you know, financing has its own baggage or there is uh, limitations which will come up. So 
I'll have to follow that dharma, in fact, uh, to actually do it right for them. But as uh, uh, impact, uh, I mean, which I'm looking for impact, we have, we, we, we have our NGO which does all that work. As a financing hair hat, I'll do financing. So that's the piece. But I just wanted to say one thing. See, I think they, this, uh, in our country, the experiences have been the islands of successes. We, I mean, I just give you one quick example. Biogas using, uh, 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 connecting toilets, the biogas was a taboo. I mean, because you can't use the gas to the cooking. cooking. Yeah. Hey, there are a lot of places I'll tell you, I can take you if you want. There are people who have built biogas toilets and they're using the gas generated for cooking. Okay, you go to Belgaum, you'll find a lot of them doing it. Now it has become a, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, I think few people did it initially and now a lot of people are doing it because that's a way of disposing the waste properly or are, are using that in a, in a more productive manner. So that's a possibility. Uh, but from a financing side, I would probably restrict and do not, do not say what to do, what, uh, what, uh, kind of toilet they need to build because different regions have different needs. There is a need for somebody to keep on training the local masons because they are the kings there. I mean, they will determine what kind of toilet to be built. So, yes, there are models of, you know, uh, uh, what, is, what do you call it, uh, toilets, uh, ready-made toilets. Yeah, but a lot of people are not aware of it. And the local mason determine, always he will tell you his constructed toilet is better than the one what he is supplying. That's that's the the people trust him, not us, because we are always seen as outsiders. We are foreigners in that place. People not necessarily trust as much. So I think um, financing might probably help in that angle to bring in this faster, low cost, standardized, better efficient toilets. So we might, we have the ability to organize people and actually give them that information. I think we can add up along with the financing. We should be, we should we can try and do that. Thank you. Bhavna, I'm going to actually ask you, because of the World Bank, and this is something which at some level World Bank is thinking, the whole issue of caste, and thinking about that when you're thinking about behavior change. I think, uh, I mean, that's a very valid point that was made about caste, and, and the reality is that in our social cultural context, it is so deeply uh, ingrained and rooted that we cannot separate it. A lot of mindset issues and actions happen because of that. So it's a one part of the bigger agenda that we are talking about behavioral change and it certainly has an important as, uh, influence in the way decisions are made. Uh, so I would say as a part of the larger awareness campaign, it's, it's, a, it's a critical factor to address. It's, it's a huge issue in some part of, of our countries more than the other parts. It's, and again, we've seen this issue manifests itself in different ways in different states. It's not just one single thing that you're, we are trying to see. Uh, it needs a very, um, as, as, as was pointed out when we are talking about this awareness raising, what we think is the my, uh, maybe the right message may not as what Sadhviji said. It's how you actually put it. And so looking at and addressing caste issues will be very important to find uh, I should say creative thinking around how do you address that that barrier. It's it's not a simple issue, and in fact, we do find it repeatedly comes around as as one of the key issues around addressing behavioral change. Thank you, Sadhiji. I'm going to ask you to actually look at the other end of the spectrum, which is regulation. What do you think about actually regulating that it's banned that people actually do open defecation? Given, of course, as Mana said, they have to have toilets first. So in places like urban India, where there is access to toilets the idea of regulation and legislation? I think it's a wonderful idea. I think that any action which so directly and so significantly impedes the human rights of others should absolutely be outlawed. So we already outlaw murder. We outlaw putting poison in other people's food or in other people's drinks. We outlaw burning down people's houses. We outlaw pretty much every behavior that we could do that would impinge upon your right to live. And so if defecating in the open is creating a national epidemic of polluted soil, polluted water, the ramifications of which are being borne by 
as I said, 1,600 children who are perishing. But, you know, for example, just in the Ganga Basin, there's 500 million people who depend upon Ganga's water for their life and livelihood. Not for moksha, not for liberation, but actually for their drinking water, for the water that irrigates their farms. And absolutely, I think that for us to pollute that water should be whether through allowing open defecation, whether through subsidizing non-organic agriculture that pollutes the water, whether through rampant materialism that makes these factories spew chemicals out 24 hours a day into the water. It all should be illegal, ideally, because it's what's leading to the illness and death of the people who depend upon that water. Thank you. I'm going to actually answer the last question myself, which is actually going back to the issue of flow of funds. Um, because I think one of the important things here is actually understanding the power of funds. There is no question that for many poor people, they cannot afford a toilet and a subsidy is going to be required. But the one thing I will just say from all the experiences that I've had here is, you need to give that money to the customer to make the choice. If somebody else, a government department, somebody else is saying, this is the provider, you're only going to get it from him, it's a disaster waiting. We need to open up the system so it's easy to happen. But end of the day, if we give the customer choice, they then select what's right. Coming back to Suresh's point, give them information with that choice. Give them examples of what they can see around them. They are smart, they'll get to the right thing. And then what will happen is they will take care of it because if they had chosen it themselves and actually put in the effort into it, they will make sure it's not going to be wasted. So I'm going to put the last plug is we need to raise awareness of the customers of their rights. We need to help them get information and we need to empower them in every way that we can. With that, I want to thank the panel. It's been fascinating having all of you here and the audience. Great questions. Thank you very much.